This is a free sample of Life Will Be the Death of Me and You 2 audiobook by Chelsea Handler. Get full audiobook for free with a free trial. More information on our website, audiobooks.co.pl. Where have I been all my life? I don't remember the actor, and I don't remember the movie, but I remember it was 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and I had just taken a couple hits off my vape pen. I needed to load my Pix account, which held pre-released movies that I was expected to screen before a star of one of the movies was a guest on my Netflix talk show. I was sitting on one of my overpriced chaise lounges, the kind that celebrities and Russians purchase for their bedrooms, when I found myself once again unable to convert the TV that descends from the ceiling from Apple TV to Pix. Rich people have descending smart televisions. The idea is that they descend silently and gracefully from the ceiling, but because I am nouveau riche, rich, mine sounds more like a helicopter landing. I'd like to blame my inability to change the mode of my television to pics on the fact that I was stoned, but that would be a lie. I'd be even less capable if I was sober. I called my assistant Brandon at his house to tell him to tell my other assistant, Tanner, who was downstairs in my house, to come upstairs and help me with the television. I hung up the phone. I looked down at the table and saw the vape pen. How many more hits of marijuana would I need to get through this movie? I knew things had hit a new low or high, depending on how you looked at the situation. I picked up the iPad that controls the TV along with everything else in my house, from the window shades to the exterior lights in my backyard to my pulse, probably, and tried to pretend that I was troubleshooting so that Tanner would think I had at least tried to figure it out on my own, as if that had ever happened before. How did I become so useless, and how many assistants did I actually have? Answer two, Brandon and Tanner. Brandon is gay and has an incredible attention to detail. Tanner is straight, and before he met me, thought that the Four Seasons was a weather pattern. Before I met Tanner, I thought Venmo was an online liquor store. Tanner was now upstairs, standing behind the chaise I was sitting on. I wondered if he could smell the weed I just smoked, and if so, what did he think of me? Did he realize that most television hosts don't even make the time to watch each movie and TV show to prepare for each of their upcoming guests? Did he understand that I was a consummate professional who went to great lengths to get ready for my show? Or did he think that I was just some rich, lucky white bitch who continued to fall upward? No, that wasn't quite right. I doubt he was thinking in terms of race, too. White people surely weren't thinking about skin color. I didn't want to watch another stupid fucking movie that I didn't care about, and I really didn't want to interview another action star bloviating about his motivation for playing a half-man, half-mermaid. I just didn't care, and I wasn't doing anyone any favors by pretending that I did. Did I ever care? The answer is yes. There was a time when all of this mattered to me. There was a time when being famous and having this kind of success and money and having a TV show was what drove me to want more and more and more. And now I found myself exhausted and ashamed by the meaninglessness of it all. I remember coming home a couple of weeks before the 2016 election on a windy fall night, which for Los Angeles is rare. Anytime there's weather in Los Angeles, even rain, it's exciting. The constant sunshine can start to grate on your nerves. I went up to my bedroom, opened up my sliding glass doors, grabbed my vape pen, and turned on some Neil Young. I lay on my bed in the dark, watching the wind blow my bedroom drapes around, hearing the ruffling of the leaves and watching the lanterns that hang from my backyard trees, swinging into each other, thinking, if there's an electrical fire, I hope the dogs will at least bark to wake me up. But overall, my thought was, this is fucking awesome. This is exactly what I'd hoped adulthood would be. No kids, no husband, no responsibilities, just a TV show on Netflix and whatever else I felt like doing whenever I felt like doing it. Not trapped, not stuck, not dependent on a single person but myself, free to be you and me. I couldn't believe how lucky my life had turned out, how many of my dreams had come true, and also my good fortune in being alive during this time in history, the year we were going to elect our first female president. I suppose I could blame my state of mind on the election of Donald Trump, so I will. I have the Trump family and their horrifying personalities and veneers to thank for my midlife crisis. Along with more than half the population of the world, I couldn't grasp how in this day and age, we elected a man who insulted Mexicans and women and Muslims and veterans and disabled people and everyone else he has insulted since. The contrast in decency between Barack Obama and Donald Trump was too much for me to bear, like electing Snooky to the Senate.
Now people were seriously talking about Dwayne The Rock Johnson running for president. How on earth did we get here? Although if I am being honest, at that point in time or at any other time during the entire Trump presidency, I would have preferred an actual rock. How could Americans have turned their back on decency? And why was I so misinformed? How did I not know that this outcome was even a possibility? What was I missing? I kept hearing the word elitists, that everyone in California and New York lived in a bubble, that the election of this lunatic was a result of all of us not knowing anything about the rest of the country. That didn't ring true for me. I had traveled all over the country doing stand-up for so many years. I had been to every major and some minor cities multiple times. I wasn't an elitist. My father was a used car dealer. I didn't have a trust fund or wealthy parents. We weren't allowed to answer the phone growing up because more often than not, it would be a bill collector. I had $400 when I drove across the country alone to move to Los Angeles and then was broke for seven years living paycheck to paycheck while simultaneously getting fired from every waitressing job I ever had. I worked for everything I have and never even went to college. How could I be an elitist without ever having gone to college? And then, oh, wait a minute, now I remember. I grew up wanting to get as far away from the life my parents had given me as possible. I had created a life in which there was a zero-tolerance policy for any discomfort. I could handle physical discomfort like dental work or elective surgery to make my thighs smaller, but not any discomfort related to not having money. Sure, I was just scraping by on those cross-country trips in the beginning of my stand-up career, barely making enough money from small comedy clubs to cover my hotel room for the week. But after a few years, I was earning more money, and the clubs turned into theaters. And then arenas with private planes and chauffeur cars, sometimes for less than 24 hours, and then on to the next city. So here I was again, not taking into account the optics, or for that matter, the reality of my own entitlement. I had become exactly what I'd always wanted to be, an elitist. I did live in a bubble inside a bigger bubble, which was inside an even bigger bubble. Three bubbles, two assistants, two cleaning ladies or more like my nannies, a driver, a pool guy, a landscaper, a florist, a houseman. <sighs> what is a houseman, you ask? Someone who walks the dogs and polishes the outdoor furniture and oh, cleans up the dog shit outside, basically an outdoor butler. When was the last time I cleaned up dog shit? Probably the last time I flew coach. I hated having these thoughts. I hated it because something clicked in the process of making these associative leaps. I realized that I'd made a career of overhydrating people with my honesty, yet I was being dishonest with myself, which left me operating in a deficit of truth. Now that I was aware of this situation, I would have to do something about it. I couldn't carry on the way I'd been carrying on, just coasting and cashing checks for essentially being a loudmouth. I took another hit of my vape. What I really wanted to do was watch the news, even though the news was giving me diarrhea. The whole administration was giving me diarrhea. My outrage was high. I had spent the year after the election being sucked into the vortex of news cycles that accompanied Donald Trump's ascendancy and my subsequent mental hernia. The news was like a high-speed merry-go-round that never slowed down long enough to figure out when it was safe to hop on or off. So like everything in my life thus far, I hopped on and stayed on. I had spent the better part of my day in a wormhole, Googling pictures of young Robert Mueller because I was developing strong sexual feelings toward him as well as his investigation. In an interesting plot twist, it turns out Bob Mueller is even hotter in his early 70s than he was when he was in the Marines. I was more attracted to present-day Bob Mueller than I would have been had I been alive during Nam. The guy fucking kills me. Who is hotter than Bob Mueller? Daniel Day-Lewis playing Bob Mueller, maybe, but the jury is out until that movie is released and Daniel Day-Lewis gives up his shoe cobbling for a year. I mean, my God. Just stop it with the cobbling. Just act. You're great at it. People adore you. No one's talking about your shoes. Maybe your wife, but I doubt it. Bob Mueller was the only hope I had that Donald Trump and that terrible vampire family he spawned would end up in prison. The investigation into Donald Trump and his conspiring with Russia and all the other crimes I'm sure he'll be indicted for made me realize what real men look like. They look like Bob Mueller. A 73-year-old with a six-pack, possibly an eight-pack, underneath that suit? You can see it through his shirt when he walks. He's ripped. Keeping your shit together is what that's called. A prosecutor, a Marine, and the director of the FBI? How on earth is any woman worth her salt meant to control herself around him and not sit directly on his face? <laughs> 